Here's your host. He's a few no-ops short of an exploit. Socially engineers the elderly, like me. And is known as the kill bit at parties, Paul Asadorian. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Paul.com Security Weekly. This is episode 332 for May 16th. Wow. 332. <laughs> 332, man. I'm here in the studio with the illustrious Mr. Where? Jack Daniel. I'm in studio again. It's awesome to be with you. He's in, vintage. In, he's noble. <laughs> he's wise. It's right, Jack Daniel. I, I have beer. Yes. <laughs> you brought some good beer. Jack, why don't you tell our listeners about the beer that you've got uh, so, uh, so this evening. Regular listeners know that I'm fond. We're all fond of uh, Omegang's uh, uh, Belgian-style um we need to break out another bottle of that. Yeah, we, need, yeah, we do need a new bottle. And so they've got a, a series, a special series, uh, celebrating HBO's Game of Thrones. And so we're trying the first of that series, Iron Throne. Which I is, like it. Uh, yeah, it's a good one. It shows a lot of nudity. A lot show. of nudity. That show or this one? Um, no, <laughs> that show. Definitely not this one. Yeah. Good. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, good. I, I gone for a couple of weeks. I wanted to, you know, <laughs> did, didn't want to, yeah. We changed the show format. <laughs> Jack, we didn't tell you? Uh, Larry Pesci's on his way here. He was stuck in traffic. Apparently, there was some crazy traffic. Executive there, producer Mike Perez was supposed to be here. He actually turned around and went home. There was so much traffic. Uh, I got through the traffic before it got really ugly, and yeah. there were four working accidents wow. in central Providence as yeah. I came through. So uh, expert mess. Steve is here. Expert Steve. Steve, I, I I don't know how long it took us, but I, I don't want to jinx it. I'm going to knock on wood. The show start was relatively smooth today. Knock on wood. It was. Uh, you have to talk into a microphone. Not too you, bad. Yes, huh? yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> Did you so, just have to tell the audio video expert? Steve got to yelled speak at into a microphone. Well, so there's two. <laughs> really quick, there's two Steve. There's <laughs> Steve that comes in studio and Steve that does post audio editing, yeah. and. Uh, audio editing Steve yelled at AV guy Steve and was like, hey, when you talk, you're talking on the microphone. Otherwise, <laughs> it's a one-way conversation, man. It's not fun to edit. <laughs> uh, yes. So we all thought that was really I, funny. I so. can't make fun of people for going off mic. Yeah. I, if you don't um, strap the microphone now, to my head. Do I, we have John Strand or Carlos Perez on the lines via Skype? We do not. Okay, so maybe they'll join us during the show. Uh, there is a separate Skype connection for them, so they won't interrupt our, our interview. Just a couple of quick announcements before we get right into our interview. Make sure you register for both of our tracks at Black Hat USA in Las Vegas. That's Defensive Countermeasures, Foundations for Becoming a Devious Defender, and Offensive Countermeasures, The Art of Active Defense. Both of those classes are happening July 27th through the 30th, and you have to register before May 31st to get the best price. So do that now. Please do, in fact, register. John and myself will be teaching those classes as we get more people for those classes, we will add more instructors. Um, so we will add people like Mike Perez and uh, some other folks, fine, talented folks. Ethan uh, will, may also join us as well. So it will be a Paul.com affair that will uh, be helping an, teach those an classes. An affair to remember. An affair to remember. It's, uh, it's very nice. It's very nice. Um, let's see. So we are looking for sponsors for monthly webcasts and this podcast for that matter. Please send email to paul at hacknaked.tv. That's me. And we'll get you the details. We've actually collected... Uh, uh, we actually have a little presentation about our sponsorship opportunities we have here on the show. And we're definitely, the first and foremost thing is looking for monthly webcast sponsors. So please do contact us. That's paul at hacknaked.tv. B-Sides Rhode Island, it's happening June 14th through the 15th right here in Rhode Island. Go get your tickets today. There'll be a fantastic lineup of presentations. The entire Paul.com crew, coupled by Josh Wright, Kevin Finisterre, uh, Joe McRae, Ron Gula, Dave Maynard, and a whole awesome other people will be there. So make sure you come check that out. Stogie Geek Show, we're taking a bit of hiatus, taking a couple of weeks off. So we'll be back in two weeks, 30 p.m. 30 p.m. p.m. Eastern time. That gives you time to go print out your $5 off coupon for the local Havana Cigar Club. And the next time we broadcast, we'll be doing it live from the Havana Cigar Club, which is it's a lot of fun. We do the podcast live, and then uh, the final segment of the show, I do this little trivia game where I, I ask trivia questions about cigars. And oh, about cigars. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I was going to say, trivia. regular trivia would be... Yeah, that was yeah. But it's cigar trivia. Larry Pesci's here in the studio. Welcome, yeah, Larry. Yeah, hey, Larry. Larry. You made it through the traffic. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was backed up for miles. Yeah. Apparently, some guy plowed into a bridge abutment type uh, deal, and they had to set up all the stuff around all do- that. And- but yeah. you're here. That's what's important now. <laughs> and more, uh, most importantly for the show, we're going to go into our first interview. Woo-hoo! I'm very pleased to welcome Mr. Brian Snow. Brian spent his first 20 years 
at NSA doing, doing and directing research that developed cryptographic components and secure systems. Many cryptographic systems serving the U.S. government and military use his algorithms. They provide capabilities not previously available and span a range from nuclear command and control to tactical radios for the battlefield. He created and managed NSA's Secure Systems Design Division in the 1980s. He has many patents, awards, and honors attesting to his creativity. Brian retired in 2006 from the NSA and is now a security consultant and ethics advisor. Brian, welcome to Paul.com. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, Brian, how did you get your start in information security? Well, I started out teaching mathematics at Ohio University from 1967 to 1971, and I helped establish the computer science department as well. In 1971, I attended a job fair at the major math conference looking for another teaching position. I asked for interviews for four schools, but my dance card came back with a fifth appointment on it from NSA, the National Security Agency. I had no idea at that time what NSA did, but I took the interview. I liked what I heard, so I went home and read David Kahn's The Code Breakers, hmm. thousand some odd pages. I then applied for a job, was accepted, put through a three-year internship in more math math mathematics courses focused on cryptology. And I stayed a total of 34 very satisfying years. Hmm. In my early years, I worked in research, as you've mentioned, and uh, strong, uh, the point is for those, all of those battlefield systems and nuclear command and control, computer security, network security, and strong assurance were major aspects for those systems. In later years, uh, when I was no longer a worker bee, I rose to be the technical director, in turn, of three major components, research, which I loved, then the information assurance directorate, that's one half of the NSA mission, we have two, uh, SIGINT and Information Assurance. SIGINT goes around the world collecting information for the government and military leadership to protect the nation. The Information Assurance Directorate had the responsibility of making sure no one else in the world could do to us what we were doing to them mm -hmm. by providing protection for our soldiers in the field and our government that they could not be eavesdropped on or detected in what they were doing. And that was a lot of fun as the white hat mission as opposed to the gray or black hat of the SIGINT mission. And uh, I was there for eight years, loved that job. It was my peak position. I loved it. And I finished my career cooling off in the internal university hmm. that we have uh, across the intelligence community. And I was there to improve the training offered in cryptanalysis and other such topics and taught a few courses there. And then I retired in 2006. So, Brian, I, one of the questions I, I wanted to ask up front, it, I was just, it piqued my curiosity when I was thinking about it today is, you know, we all wake up and we go to work in some capacity, whether it's the office or, you know, I work from the home. And I know what it's like when I, my experience of going to work, what's it like when you get up and go to work for the NSA? Well, for one thing, uh, in the early years at least, you had to make darn sure when you left the night before, in, in research, they gave us freedom on our calendars. And you could come and go as you wished, but when you left at night, you had to sign in the next day what time you expected to arrive. If you did not arrive within two hours, they sent Marines looking for you. <laughs> and one of my neighbors also worked at the agency, and uh, they came looking for him, knocking at his door. He was not home. They had my address as the next nearby NSA employee. I didn't know that. They came knocking at my door, asking if I knew where he was. No, he got in trouble later. Turned out he'd been out an all night drunk the night before and wasn't sober enough to come back home. <laughs> but they do track you down and mm -hmm. keep track of where the employees are coming and going. And many, of course, work standard shifts. But the type of work I was doing, I was never shift bound. That's one novel story. Uh, give me the tail end of the question again. I'll give you a more serious answer. Uh, what's it, it like to go to work in the morning? Yeah, what's it like to go to work in the morning? Like, well, you have and to I guess your that... badge as well, so you get past the Marines or the now run a cops that we have that check going in and out and then you get to your office going down long halls in a very huge building the main headquarters building go to your desk uh, and in my arena that i played in turn on your computer or ask your secretary and get the days in my later career i'd say what's my agenda card for today and i would get an agenda card with 15 to 20 meetings ticked out through the day with various people I got to compare with some senior people coming in from industry that we were talking with, and they also had the little card prepared by their secretaries. They typically had five to seven meetings per day. 
So I think the agency did pretty good working the staff pretty hard mm, mm. <laughs> to get the job done that we needed to do. Do you have any other way you want to steer the question? Uh, no, no. I, I think that definitely covered the uh, what I wanted to get out of the uh, the answer. So thank it's, you. It's for not that. nearly as uh, as because well, the only time I would see it is in the movies, right? Right. You know? you know, there's like apparently no th- soundtrack in that. Yeah, there's no soundtrack when you walk in. Um, so uh, the oh. <laughs> yeah, the the next question I, I had was, um, what advice you have for people who are getting their start in computer security? It's a very good field conceptually to be in, but it's not being allowed by the major industries that want to buy the products to grow as it should. They are still far too focused. Your customer set that you'll be serving in computer security in the external world, NSA was a different matter entirely, is still far too focused on maximum profit in the next quarter for shareholder value and do not want to hear about long delay lines and getting things finished. And uh, quality is not the first word they want to hear. They want to hear fieldable, get it out there. We can always do a mod later and do a retrofit to customer customer after the fact if need be. And they typically have a product they want to sell. And they'll go to their customers and try to market to the customer base this wonderful product. Please do this. You'll love it. And the NSA was responsible for supporting the military, and we would go and we would interview and talk with them. What do you want? What do you need, either on the battlefield or in your office space or labs? And they would specify that. Uh, When the Internet took off in the 1980s with WWW, the World Wide Web, and people started trying to make money on the web, suddenly they wanted to buy crypto systems to protect things. But again, they wanted it fast in software, and they wanted it you know, within a quarter or whatever, and they didn't want to hear about quality or robustness or checking on it. Whereas to get an NSA system in the field to satisfy the military would – well, let me give an example. The commercial types would go to a military officer and say, we have new DES radios back in those years, or now AES radios, Hmm. and they have these additional side functions that you'll love, please buy. And they would say, well, we should check with NSA first, they're a normal provider, and they would come to us and tell us what they'd been offered. They said, you can buy it if you wish, we allow that now, in the past we would not, we'd provide it ourselves. But we said, we can also give you a battlefield radio that has AES or DES encryption, whatever they've offered you. But you realize that once you encrypt the signal, that the enemy will not want you to be able passing messages they cannot read. So they are going to um, be a little ticked about that, and they're going to send rocketry toward your communication bases and take out your communication infrastructure. Do you want that, or would you like a little uh, discreet fiddling of the signal so it is not detectable? They cannot detect the signal, or at least they cannot track it. We can make a jitter so they cannot track it and see where it's coming from. They said, that sounds pretty good. We said, yep, we can do that. It'll be a few more months. It'll be a few more bucks to pay for it, but that's doable. But you realize once they cannot, you know, find the signal either that um, – well, anyway, we go through a dialogue with them is what I'm trying to get at, really making sure they understood all the possibilities, not trying to market what we had, but checking with them what functions did they need to have to feel safe in the field. And then that's what we would go away and build into the product. But it didn't come in just a few months. It was a hardware build. build. So that was very robust, could be stepped on by the soldiers. It had a steel case, not a plastic case, mm. and was very, very robust in the field, both against cryptographic attacks as well as environmental attacks. Many of our radios had to survive for the Navy, the salt and sea environment that could be dropped in the sea and still work. Soldiers in uh, hot climates and sandy deserts had to be able to have devices that wouldn't crap out when the temperature got above 130 degrees, like Afghanistan or other places, and would still function in below freezing weather in case that was going on. So the design requirements we had for our gear were military requirements, not standard office environments. That took a lot of stuff non-cryptographic just to make sure it would work in all possible Mm. situations for the soldier carrying the gear. Hmm. So that was a little higher load on them. But we didn't require a profit margin. We were funded through the government military cycles, so it wasn't that much more screamingly expensive than the commercial stuff. Although to pay for much of it, it it was more expensive, but it gave a lot more capability that the soldiers really appreciated. Mm. Did that help, or is that close direction for you or not? That was perfect. 
Uh, so we often, on the, uh, particularly on this show, we call people out for developing and creating their own encryption algorithms. Uh, and I noticed in your bio it said that you had researched and developed some of it on your own. What are some yes. of the, the, the major hurdles when creating such an algorithm? Um, let me be a little blunt about this. Anyone who tries to design their own crypto algorithm these days and take it to market, certainly as a single person or any team of less than three to five highly competent uh, finite math uh, mathematicians in finite mathematics, various sorts of uh, disciplines in that arena is a fool to try hmm. because it's a very hard job to build something that cannot be attacked. You spend a few months, maybe a year, designing it, tweaking it, and testing it, but you have your mental print on it. And at least the my agency and others like it around the world are quite willing to take a new design once they get their hands on it. And commercial things you can't hide. They're going to find them and buy their own copy and take it apart and find out what's running inside of it. But to do the cryptanalysis on it, they're quite willing to invest months to long years. It took some of these systems that we broke in the agency 50 years to crack. Mm. But we kept working at it and we got them cracked. So it is not a sport you take on lightly, mm. not without a significant staff, not only of competent designers. Plus, we had designers and breakers. And in the commercial world, they tend to be the same guy because they have the same depth that they go to. The mathematicians we had on staff, we typically divided into two camps, the makers and the breakers, because the makers tended to be more synthetic thinkers that liked to slam things together and see what fit and what they could make work, whereas the other camp, the breakers, were more analytic. They liked to slice and dice and tear things apart, and they got to each practice their own discipline, either building or cracking, to extreme depths which I have not yet seen available in the public sector. So you can go down so far on either path with equal competence as a standard average mathematician. But after a while, your own personal style comes out as either analytic or synthetic. And to really polish and use that, the agency made very, took very good advantage of that because you could be an artist in one of those fields but not the other hmm. when you kept diving deeper and deeper and spending more time on the problems. That's just really interesting. I like the idea of makers and breakers. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, but we had a large staff and we allowed them plenty of time. In the design cycle, we would allow months to a year or so to design the paper. We'd allow three to five years for a, as large a team as wished to be pulled together of mathematicians. And we had uh, thousands of people at NSA hired as mathematicians working as mathematicians, mm -hmm. not working as actuaries or something else with the typical career for mathematicians outside. So our mathematicians to be either top secret famous or public famous but as far as having a lot of people to talk to it was a larger community at that time inside this is back in the early 80s as the world was taking off externally commercially to be aware of cryptography now there's probably as many public cryptographers outside as there are in the government spaces but i don't think more yet hmm. and as far as spending the time and effort over long months and years of large teams and powerful uh, custom-made computers trying to crack and break i don't see any uh, commercial or public facility in the world doing that. Yeah, it, it's a great segue into one of my other questions, which was, uh, what is the lifetime of an encryption algorithm? And a follow-on is, you know, does it have a defined lifetime uh, before you must work on an update, or do you just completely switch to something new? Oh, they certainly have a defined lifetime because you realize that most algorithms will be broken in time. They are a finite device. And I forget the jargon term for it now, but there is a well-known curve of uh, – our, our, our formula internally was that you manage to get a factor of – I, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Help me out here. X years go by, and the computer power to break things increases by factor Y. Moore's law. That sort Moore's of thing. Law, so, you yeah. know, as time goes on, the machines get more and more powerful. So, there is no such thing as a per perfect crypto algorithm built with a finite number of chips or uh, lines of code will be breakable at some defined year by simple brute force, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. So, we always had to design to exceed brute force. 
Right, right. And we had to have that as brute force at the expected end of life. Now, some of our algorithms we wanted to last for decades, and some of our algorithms were throwaway. We didn't mind if they vanished after use for 18 months or so. Hmm. But we knew in each category of gear that we were building how long we wanted it to last. We could add on a design insurance factor, which is classified, I cannot tell you. But it was, you know, just in case we made a mistake in the design, hmm. let's add on a fudge factor of even more years of analysis that the enemy might be able to do. And uh, so we'd really built to very worst case standards because to make the crypto algorithm uh, with standard cryptography at least twice as hard we only had to add one more bit to the crypto variable and that would double the size of the search space they'd have to go through for brute force exhaustion so we could very easily measure at least against brute force how long it would take for the world to grow up and get computing power enough to break it. We had to worry about the attacker coming up with a clever way of getting in and knocking off many factors of 10 of the work factor to actually start solving it. That was a more nuanced problem. That's why we had human staff on hands, the hundreds of mathematicians that worked on the IED side as attackers going after the various codes that the design group designed. The design group was about 20 of us designing these things, and the attacking group was larger, larger internally as well uh, because cryptanalysis is a much harder sport to play than crypto design it's a, it's an okay. interesting perspective that you had or that, you know government agents because if if we look at uh, you know software companies that are trying to protect intellectual property or even manufacturing firms the the life cycle of that you know the value of that is uh, uh, not that long um, mm -hmm. But you know, you, you're they talking to, about you're uh, talking sell about, more right. units, and they'd like to retire old gear and replace with newer stuff just to get another bite at the customer. Right. That wasn't our goal. Our right. goal was to first meet the requirement for stable communications between whatever nodes we're talking. If you have missiles buried in the ground that you expect to be there for decades, you want the crypto control functions also to last for decades without having to retrofit. Right. So you do a very robust design with all sorts of design factors built in, including the long life they will be in use, so that you're really setting them to be where they're not going to be breakable under uh, worst-case assumptions for decades yet. You don't design for a five-year life or a three-year life or a whatever right. life on long on long life gear. And so once you build them, they also have to have high reliability. You don't want to be taking the lid off the silos very often to go down right. and repair or mess with them. <laughs> so they're very strong reliability constraints as well. Again, I'm talking niche markets and right. some of this stuff. Yeah, the radios the guys carried around in the field uh, had a high breakage rate because tanks would run over them and the soldier would step on them. Mm -hmm. and despite the steel case, there could be damage and you'd have to replace them. But that was with spares and stock, not by making the algorithms weaker or cheaper. Right, right. I mean, and, you know, some of that information that you're protecting, you know, not just for military, but like, I'm thinking State Department and other things is stuff that uh, even if it loses tactical value has uh, political value or right. political yes. liability for decades. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yep. yeah, it's an interesting thing. They want to be safe interest. for a long, long time. Well, that, that kind of leads into another thing that you've spoken about. Well, there on. is something interesting. I'll, I'll give you one of the side questions. I will not give you the answer. But we were approached at one time by people responsible for protecting some of the old weaponry designs on the nuclear side. You know, how to build a nuclear bomb with what sorts of material. And it turns out that as time goes on and technology improves externally, bad dudes around the world that might want to build their own weaponry – don't need to build weapon equivalent equivalent to the best available today in the leading nations. They're quite happy to build a dirty bomb that would be equivalent to the big boy dropped on Hiroshima. And if they could get those design plans, that would have high value for them, they'd build to it and be done. So in some peculiar way, they had the feeling that the older design information that was rotting in the archives was more important to protect against loss than the newer designs, which are far more expensive that's, to produce and required a uh, hmm. leading nation state that's capability to do. That's so it's to re reduce the threat from minor players getting in and growing up, they wanted to come in and say, we've encrypted this in something we thought was good for 20 years and that you said you could provide, but now we've would like to make sure that we can protect it longer. Can you can you now give us new cryptography to protect the stuff even longer for the old stuff? We said yes, but it's going to be of limited use because anybody interested has probably already caught whatever traffic was encrypted talking about the old stuff and ciphered in the old stuff, and that's all they have to break is the stuff they recorded and saved. 
our re-encrypting a new and better algorithm isn't going to buy you much if they are halfway clever because they would have kept all the old transmissions until they could grow up to the point where they could attack those. So that's a strange nuance for you. Most things have a limited intelligence life. After a while, you don't care if it gets broken. But nuclear secrets have very long life, mm. and they get more and more sensitive the older they are because then they're cheaper to build. Yeah, that's um, you know, it's it's funny, Jack. There's a, a question here about uh, quantum computing. Yeah, I was just gonna go. I, well, it, so just a quick story. I was teaching a class on firewall security, like bits and bytes, ports, rules, mm -hmm. and someone asked the question. Well, you know, with this whole quantum encryption. And quantum computing, you know, do we need security anymore? <laughs> so, yes. Jack, I don't know if you want to frame that question better, but that's, yeah. I, I think we can say the yes to that The quantum computer question. cannot break all cryptography. As a matter of fact, I was the co-chair from NSA with Miles Smith and Ed Roback from uh, NIST taking uh, a switch in tours and developing the AES algorithm. NSA played a background role, NIST was in front, but we served as a source they could go to to do some of the hard grunt work and analysis of some of the candidates that were offered. And uh, it was really intriguing. I went, what was your question again in the last sentence? I want to make, I'm wandering. Oh, well, we, we were sort of wandering. We were too, wandering. On the, too. Yeah, check on the, the, frame on that. Crypto, crypto. But, right. you know, going along the line of uh, quantum computing. Uh, oh, well, and what are computing. you know what are the uh, implications the, for what's coming? And this you know plays back into our, our well, last that, that's conversation important because uh, at AES we were aware at that time when we ran that competition that quantum computers might be real at some point. And for cryptographic purposes, there are two piles of cryptography. There is standard cryptography, uh, the usual code books and old type ciphers and stuff, and you try to attack those with a public key with a um, quantum computer, and it'll run much faster than a regular computer, so you can get more done, and so it will be breakable. But you only lose about half the bits. You lose about, if you had a 64-bit algorithm like DES was, it's reduced in effect to strength to 32 bits. Okay? So you get 2 to the 32 strength instead of 2 to the 64. That's a huge reduction. Okay? Yep. But with AES, which we knew we wanted to be at 128-bit strength minimum, we were afraid about quantum computing. So we simply made the key size 256. If quantum computers came to be, uh, you could cut that key size in half. This is an oversimplification, of course. It'd be a little fudge factor making it not quite that bad off. But it, it cut it essentially in half uh, with the mathematics that could be run on a quantum computer. And you would still be safe because it'd be equivalent to AES at 128 bits on a standard computer. So you could take into account and defeat quantum computing simply by doubling the key size for a traditional old-style crypto. But the Internet, and we'll get to this, and that's a very important issue that we want to talk about, has other key other crypto algorithms in a public key crypto processes you've got elliptic curves you've got diffie hellman you've got rsa uh, there's several of them out there all of which are key components in various parts of the internet structure ssl relies on these things secure uh, secure service uh, secure socket layer in any event so what is the energy of a quantum computer against public key processes that depend on either uh, factoring or discrete logs or other stuff that we can get into? They all have the same underlying mathematical basis. There, the quantum computer is indeed incredibly powerful. It essentially flatlines them. No matter how much bigger a key size you get, you can double the key size. It only adds a smidgen to the work factor under a quantum computer. These puppies die. And that is a genuine threat. Why? Because let's compare two timelines. Even up to 10 years ago, people felt that, uh, certainly as of 20 years ago, quantum computing was just a dream. NSA funded quantum computing research, as a matter of fact, in public, because we expected to show that it was impossible. What we wound up showing was it's just a damned hard problem. But it will emerge. And people are selling quantum computers today. D-Wave and others are out there selling mid-size quantum, uh, quantum computers. NSA, you could read the newspapers a while back, purchased one, and they're running it in their Utah plant on 128-bit key sizes and stuff. But that's standard key – and it's just, you know, big deal. But quantum computers 
have been shown to already exist at some level of capability. Now, to go after the key sizes used on the public key stuff, you need a bigger space that can be entangled in the quantum computer. So you're going to have to be able to entangle more bits. But they've already gone from entangling just three bits to five bits to eight bits, which is a big accomplishment, to where NIST recently produced a chip that entangles 200 and some odd bits on the wafer. So there have been several breakthroughs in just the past few years. As of 20 years ago, they thought the earliest possible chance that a quantum computer was 50 years. Uh, a few years back, they thought, well, probably 20 years, but probably not less than that. Ralph Merkel of uh, Public Key fame and other – and he's now a very big nut in nanotechnology. On his webpage, you can go to it, www.merkle.com. Easy, short. URL to get to uh, is confident that uh, we will see quantum computing in possibly as little as 10 years capable of taking on these algorithms underwriting the uh, internet security structures. Now that is a genuine goddamn threat. If you can actually get a quantum computer in 10 years and maybe as late as, as, late as 20 years, it's going to be too late already to get the net fixed. Because to fix the net, you have to replace the PKC, the public key crypto algorithms currently in use. You have to take all that stuff out and put in new stuff. And the new stuff does not yet exist. And to get new algorithms installed in the internet takes typically at least a five-year exercise. And people have been working on this. They know it's a hard problem. I started pounding the table in 2006 at various conferences I go to saying uh, – Quantum computing is going to be a threat. PKCs uh, can be destroyed. You really, please, you must urgently come up with non-PKC-based replacements for the processes we see. And they've been working since then in many communities. None have found one that worked yet. So it's a hard problem. But there are predictions, you know, that maybe within five years they will have something. So what if they get it in five years? And I don't have high confidence in that they will be able to find robust enough algorithms for – Against standard computers even, that will be a good replacement. That's not the end of the job. You have to get them adopted as a standard. That's about a five-year drill. Once you have the standard in place, you then have to start getting people to switch over and to implement through various nodes and points around the world. And that is a 10 to 15-year window. So you've got five years to develop, five years to standardize, 10 to 15 years to get that in place. And that's still not across the whole internet, but across a large bulk of it before you begin feeling halfway safe. Now, what did I add up? Five, five, 10 minimum, that's 20 years. If it is possible, as Merkel thinks, that they could emerge as soon as 10 years from now, we're screwed. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's okay? pretty much where There will be no at. such thing as security on the Internet as far as using any of the trust structures currently in place. Wow. That scares the hell out of me. That is uh, – well, I mean, that, that is scary. And it, you, the, so we have to start yeah. moving now. And I really think Nick – NIST, and I've been nudging them and others are, should run another contest just like we had for AES to come up with new algorithms that do not use the current basis processes factoring and other known processes that fall so flat under a quantum computer, but new processes but still have the properties of public key crypto. And if we cannot get to that lovely split of public key crypto, which has the key that encrypts different from the key that decrypts, that's the magic that makes public key work. If you cannot get that, then roll back to stuff we know how to use, standard, standard key distribution centers that can use standard cryptography and use AES and SHA-3 or stuff like that, and at least you'll be safe against the quantum computers. But you still have a minimum of a 20-year run-up to do that, absolutely. And quantum computers may be ready before that. We just haven't been moving fast enough, and I'm probably harping on this too long. Yeah, no, but it, but I think it, it's. Uh, did you want to question three under? I, I was gonna I was gonna shift. Um, or do you go ahead, Jack? Let's let's shift gears to the, the second question in here, just because. Um, I mean, we could we could talk on, but one of the that I wanted to bring up, which is uh, very practical. So from the, not that the quantum stuff is uh, purely theoretical, but uh, to a much more uh, immediate question, um, given. That none of us have, you know, none of us that are doing defense um, have adequate resources, time, money, personnel. Uh, what do you think deserves the most focus for protection from attacks? I mean, you know, the, we're spending a lot of cycles protecting credit card data, which, um, you know, if my identity is stolen, it's going to really wind me up. But is that where we should be uh, focusing? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of hype about SCADA and industrial control. 
it's largely theoretical. Uh, I got you. I'm ready to go after that. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? Okay, I've, I, I've characterized this crudely as do we go and protect infrastructure first or do we protect the banks? That's an important issue. Or do we protect commercial uh, corporations? that are part of the economic backbone of the nation. And for me, it is very, very easy. The first and most important thing to take care of is infrastructure. And why do I give you that order and list it first? Uh, I invite any of you to Google, quote, Sagery testimony, unquote. Uh, that's Sagery, S-A-Y-D-J-A-R-I, testimony, Sagery testimony. That is a testimony to a congressional committee on April 25, 2007, where they're talking about the threats the internet faces and what needs to be done to get clean and get going. And they did something called a Dark Angel study. It's a seven or eight page report, but the Dark Angel study is described in less than one page. And I'll give you just a few phrases from that here. The Dark Angel study assumed the adversary had three years of preparation time, a $500 million budget, and 30 days to actually execute an attack. The attack campaign goal was to destabilize the U.S. and depress the uh, economy with attacks on critical infrastructure, thus reducing our ability to project military power, depicting our will to fight, and creating panic and distrust in the government. And for them, infrastructure meant – and I just checked with them today – I have the piece of paper here. Here we go. Infrastructure includes first and foremost power, electricity. Secondly, telecommunications. If you can't call around and make communications, you're in a heap of trouble, especially for first, uh, first responders. You have to remain the ability to tell people there's been a problem somewhere. Go help and fix it. Third, in order, uh, you include the banks for sensitivity. And fourth, because they're part of the infrastructure, the commercial, inf uh, commercial but it's mostly fiscal stuff. And fourth, oil and gas. And they had – done exercises with a team of professionals and had it fully vetted by domain experts if they were making correct assertions, and they felt they could, with that budget, hold the nation essentially captive for 30-plus days. No electricity, no water flowing from power plants, gas pumps stopped. If you kill the electricity, most commercial cars and trucks won't run very long anyway because they run out of gas in the tank and they'll go to the gas station and the pumps aren't running because there's no electricity mm -hmm. unless you've got fuel-based generators running. And you do that, you run out of the fuel to run the generators, and again, you're not moving. So it gets very severe. The concern I have they were worried about a nation state trying to slap us around a little bit to get us into line. Could we be really crippled? Yes, we can. I'm concerned more about psychotic folk who still have budgets. Can anyone state leadership of Iran or that sort yeah. of activities that might want to just be pissed as hell at us and slap us hard? And they might want to be psychotic enough to merely want to impose a maximum number of deaths possible on the U.S. They would go after the infrastructure. Kill the power, kill the water, especially if it's in the coldest spot of winter. They're watching the weather forecast and do it during some heavy storm in the northern region of the U.S. when the temperature is already low and cold and the roads are clogged. If they get hit at that time and hold it down for 30 days, I believe there would be a massive loss of life. Tens of thousands of people could die. And the estimates put forth by the committee and their closed work went much higher than that. I'm being very conservative on these figures, okay? Yeah. And this work has been vetted by many people, and you, uh, uh, people can contact me offline. I'll send a copy of notes and stuff if people want to see it. Just to my name, Brian Snow at Comcast.net. Send me email. I'll give you more data on this. But it's frightening as hell. So, yes, we have to go after the infrastructure and do as much as we can to get the power, the dams, the uh, gas, oil lines protected robustly by whatever means possible. It's going to be easier than the other areas because those industries, the large infrastructure components, are regulated. They're already used to having somebody's hand up their tush trying to tell them what to do. And it could be you could sweeten the pot by having the government offer to pay for some of the upgrades. Just put it in place. We've got some procedures, or you can pick your own if it'll play with the rest of the stuff out there that it needs to play with, and we can get you protected faster. We might have a chance within two to five years of getting at least somewhat safer in infrastructure because I think the infrastructure Structure components would be more willing to play with the government to get it done than what we've seen from the commercial world for the past several decades. All they're still paying attention to is next quarter's profit. It's very hard to get them to wake up. Yeah, and the infrastructure people, we have to get them robust or we will face large numbers of deaths in the nation's worst case. 
okay? Yeah. So clearly I'd go after the infrastructure first. Now, who would I go to next? And that infrastructure for me includes power, telecommunications, and I'll put banks off to the side just for a moment now, and the oil and gas industries, those as a minimum. That actually shuts down stuff going to the stores. Food cannot travel to the grocery stores. People will be running out of food because the trucks can't roll without the gas, blah, blah, blah. It all just dovetails and crashes down on itself. The second party I would go after would be the banks because they talk with each other a lot. The money flows all over the nation, and to keep the fiscal flow moving, you can't have too many banks go down. So I'd go and protect the banks next. We would not suffer loss of life if the banks went down, at least not for a while to take other things to do it. But it would be highly inconvenient. All sorts of unexpected entailments would be happening, and the economy would be wrecked for a while. But there wouldn't be massive loss of life. So they Brian, can have, have you ever considered writing a screenplay? Hollywood, though, Hollywood, though, sir. Um, <laughs> seriously, Sammy, that- Sammy Sadry already did it in this report that he uh, briefed to Congress and their Dark Angel study. That's the name of it, the Dark Angel study of what a halfway competent guy with a checkbook with $500 million waiting for three years to develop the stuff could do with a small team, eight, ten people, hmm. appropriate skills selected. And this has been briefed to Congress. It has been briefed to many other people. Very few people doubt this stuff. In fact, most believe it is an uh, underestimate of severity of impact. We are fragile. Okay, but let's wrap it up and get to the commercial sector. What if we had attacks that were taking down major corporate firms? Here, typically, it's for money or to cripple them or a competitor trying to gut them or doing whatever stuff. Who knows? But that's third on my list, and I don't care much about it, partly because I'm a little pissed off at the many years the commercial sector has had already to improve its security processes. And they still have that focus on next quarter's profit, and they don't want any hardware. It's all got to be in software, and it has to be flexible, and it has to be blah, blah, blah. And they never say first, secure, and work to save my ass. And as long as they have that mindset, they are not salvageable. So as far as I'm concerned, go to hell, guys. You've had your chance. But also, (laughs) I think there'd be less impact on the nation because once a major commercial firm goes down, it won't be long before its competitors move in and take over the field. And there'll still be backstops unless the opponent is trying to take down everyone serving a particular type of product line in the commercial sector. Mm-hmm. So the greatest risk I see is to infrastructure. We've got to get it fixed. Yeah. Jack, Next. you want to so, uh, yeah, so, continue maybe with questions? Yeah, so that you? actually um, that leads in uh, to my next question, which you and I have chatted briefly about before, which is risk. Um, you know, risk, uh, you know, these are my words, and I have some friends who will probably cringe at this, but I don't mean them. So, But risk uh, has become a religion uh, to some people in the InfoSec community. Um, and... Uh, as have metrics, and a lot of times uh, they're tools that are used properly, and a lot of times they aren't. But um, some people really just don't think that. Uh, I don't know how to how to phrase this. Uh, I think there are some things where risk analysis uh, is a huge asset and can be done well if you have adequate instrumentation and awareness. And even if you don't have everything you need, you know, Bayesian theory helps us move forward. But there are some times when um, the cons should shift the value of risk assessments uh, or, or reduce the value of risk assessments, I think. Uh, and this is something that you've spoken about before and, and written about, too. So uh, just the whole idea of risk as religion and where um, where risk analysis well, really works and where it doesn't. I've had people ready to cut my throat on some of the things I've said <laughs> about risk analysis, but they're reading me too broadly. I'm specifically concerned by something called probabilistic risk analysis where they will use Bayesian uh, mathematics and other processes to estimate certain things and set up things and do calculations showing it's not quite as bad as we thought because this and that sort of thing trades off, balances out. And probabilistic risk analysis is, in fact, an excellent tool as long as you're addressing benign problems. If you've built a large, complex power plant with many moving parts, you can talk about the average wear and tear on various components. You can talk about the average loss of some component breaking or doing whatever. And you can get fairly accurate estimates on when you have to worry about something going, how many could go at the same time, how much backup capacity do I have to plan for in order to maintain full utilization and running time in a infrastructure element, if you will. They're very good at this for the power generators and other stuff, as long as a benign environment. That is, we know what to expect. There's not malice out there. 
an example I like to give, an architect facing only benign nature uh, and trying to build homes in Florida that gets lots of storms coming across the coast can do probabilistic risk analysis and other probability models to state that my structures will be very good up through a level four hurricane. Level five may floor some of my buildings, or if he wants to tolerate that. So he can tell his customers uh, the expectation of my stuff lasting for you, the probability of a storm that will take out my building is not for another 15, 20 years or whatever. You know, so you can give figures like that. Uh, because And he can go build – once he's built one building and put it up and it works and it meets it, he can build lots of others because nature doesn't change its rate of hurricane production, at least – Modulo global warming, that's another issue. It could get worse. But uh, nature doesn't change its activity based on what you built. Okay, it's going to behave roughly the same or in predictable ways that you can say over time. So probabilistic risk assessment is great. But if you've got malice, if we assume that the hurricane season is malicious and driven by some evil creature, as soon as they know that you can counter hurricane levels of – hurricane level four storms, you'll see nothing but hurricane level five and six thereafter coming at you. They will change the game on you. And that's what we're facing in the security arena because you have malicious opponents, and there you don't want to play probability games. The best game to play is game theory in gaming what your opponent will do once you do something. And you want to be on the right side so that each of you are strategizing, that each of you with fairly inexpensive steps can slowly but surely walk the opponent, either the attacker or the designer of the good stuff, to a spot where he's at a cliff that he can't go any further, must back up a way big way, and then start over again on some other path. You really want to make him burn more money than you, but you know it is a constant give and take, ping-ponging back and forth. That as soon as they counter you, you're going to find a way to spend a little more money and beat the hell out of them again anyway. So if you've got malice in play, and that's the one thing the commercial sector simply will not get their minds around. They still have random models in mind even when malice is in play. It does not work. So drop the PRA stuff specifically when malice is in play. For safety, for safety uh, procedures, for other sorts of analysis, for reliability, it's magnificent. Hang in, lads, run with it, but not when malice is in play. Don't do it. You're setting yourself up to be shot, hopefully only in the foot. Uh, Brian, just uh, changing gears a little bit, I wanted to uh, get to a topic that uh, I Was that enough on that? Or you yeah. want to no, no, thank, thank you very perfect. much. Yeah, thank we're you. Uh, yeah, I, did, I wanted to get to a, a question that I think uh, relates certainly very much so to national security and what the state of current uh, computer engineering, security engineering talent in the U.S. that can provide support for national security and what can we do to better develop this talent if it uh, is in fact lacking here in the U.S.? Well, talent emerges when it gets paid for, and most of the, and most of the commercial <laughs> sector is not willing to pay for the level of talent needed to give it the perception it wants. But there are several consortia, universities, government sources, and others trying to grow a truly talented uh, worker base, and it's, it's possible. We had one at NSA for decades. Okay, in this arena, it's doable. It just takes resource to build and groom. So what is necessary is once you've built it, that there are customers willing to pay the salaries necessary to retain and keep them. Mm -hmm. And there is, there's a lot of activity going on now. I hope some of them succeed. But mostly, we're being driven by cruel economics, that most of the customers that need this most, the commercial sets out there, simply aren't willing to pay enough to make the really good designers step forward and the really good builders build gear robust enough to meet worst-case analysis of competent, malicious actors. Mm -hmm. And you also true. have to pay attention to two levels of attackers. There are the generic attackers just running through a list of internet addresses looking for weakness that they can get in and skim out some money or something they can sell to somebody else, some sort of you know private property. If they hit a fairly well-protected machine, they don't bother. They skip it. That's what I call a generic attack. Mm. They're going for volume. They're not going for your ass. They're going mm. for any ass that's left flapping. And they find enough of them, they don't have to work very right, hard. They can right. pull in millions a year just picking on bozos and dum-dums. Okay? So that's the generic class. I'm not worried about that. Just follow you know, the usual process of keeping your machine updated, of having a good uh, malware scanner running in the background and stuff. You're going to be reasonably good to defeat that class. The 
targeted attacks that know you have something of value and they want it, they're going to come for you full bore with the full capabilities that they have or can hire and do. And there, we don't have in the commercial set yet any gear capable of protecting against the full bore, high level, almost nation state involvement for targeted attacks. Just doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Okay? So, uh, it's do you doable. Think that, um, the... Just people haven't stepped up to the plate yet. Do you think that our uh, enemies, competing nation states, will pay more for our talent if we're not careful? Do you think that kind of stuff happens? Oh, they will pay for the talent wherever it is sitting. Mm. And we don't have a monopoly on that. They're very talented people in this area in many nations around the world with much lower standards of living than we have because this doesn't require a lot of money, a lot of money to do. It's mostly brain work. Right, right. And doing, you know, prototype developments that don't have to be fully robust under an assurance regime to know that it's really bomb-proof against an opponent beating on it. You try to work out the concepts to get them, you know, in place and working well, and then you can robustify with a customer that wants to run that way. And the brain power, you can find it in India, you can find it in England, you can mm-hmm. find it in many other places. So we are not unique in having people competent enough to do if only people would pay them to work and uh, focus on the intensity they need and for the lower levels of profit you're going to be able to turn on something facing targeted malice because there are fewer targets therefore fewer sets will be sold you know you know, there's only a few big targets you want to go to where you can pull out billions in one shot mm-hmm. if you're going after money you know uh, the Jack, uh, stock market exchange stuff would be nice to strip and we've seen some close runs on that lately uh, Jack, we, we probably have time for one, maybe two more questions. Brian, was there any other questions that we didn't get to yet yeah, that let's, you let's wanted to answer? Let's give you uh, an opportunity. We've sort of been steering this. I know some of these are things that you wanted to talk about. but uh... Well, there are two questions you gave me, and it'll take me about probably 10 minutes to get through both of these. But I do. I thought you wanted to hear a little bit about assurance and something yeah. about uh, the difference in trust between cyber and human yes. elements. Yeah, let's go uh, through that. In, and then in we'll case, which one would you like to hear first? Uh, Jack, it's up to you. You developed the, the, the um, let's uh, talk about the the assurance idea because the I think the trust one's a good. I think one that's important because I, I, that's, that would have been my choice. As getting before, I was regretting having offered you the choice. I'm glad you picked it because I think that's the one that's missing the most in the outside world on this. So let me natter at that a little bit. Uh, I'll give two definitions, a very short, simple one and a longer one, but let me set the stage a little bit. Uh, We need both functions and assurances in a security device. Functions are typically visible to the user and commanded through an interface. Assurances tend to be invisible to the user, but they keep him safe anyway. They are extra quality control steps taken during the development of a product. The safety and reliability communities have been doing this for decades. We need to apply more of it in the commercial world to security stuff. You can go and learn from those communities. Examples of assurance work would be thicker insulation on a power wire to reduce the risk of shock, or failure analysis to show that no single transistor failure in a large complex device in a a security compromise. Those are paper studies that you do, and there, since you are designing and looking at them and not yet worrying about people, well, I'm not going to go back to the... Let me skip that. Having a seatbelt in a car provides a safety function. Its interface is the latch that you click around your waist. Having them made of nylon instead of cotton is the result of assurance studies that showed nylon lasts longer and retains its strength better in the harsh environment of a car's interior. You can stand spilling a beer on the belt and letting it soak in. It'll rot the cotton. It won't bother the nylon. I, especially I tend not to drink while driving, but maybe that's, that's just me. Well, that's I'm having, you guys are having your beers while we're talking. So. <laughs> anyway, uh, both functions and assurances are best addressed during the initial design and engineering of security systems, not as aftermarket patches. Both security and assurance must be addressed first. The earlier you include a security architect in your design process, the greater is the likelihood of a successful and robust design. The usual quip, he who gets to the interface first wins. So you got to be there first or you're just going to be screwed and lost. It'll have too many uh, covert channel paths built in for convenience and memory. Because most computer systems built today, remember computers were expensive when they were first built. So they're built to share resources. They shared memory. They shared uh, all sorts of things. And security has first and foremost as its paradigm separation, separating the good guy's data from the bad guy attacker. 
And it's very hard once you have a system that wants to share to build in separation on top of it. The residue is covert channels, at least, if not worse stuff. That's the, why we're in the pickle today with computer security, because computers were built first to share, not to separate. Mm. Okay? So Here's a short intuitive definition of assurance. Assurance work makes a user or an accreditor more confident that the system works as intended without flaws or surprises, even in the presence of malice. That's short and sweet. What the hell does it mean? You have to parse it a bit more. We analyze the system at design time for potential problems that we then correct. We test prototype devices to see how well they perform under stress or when used in ways beyond the normal specification. Security acceptance testing not only exercises the product for its expected behavior given the expected environment and input sequences. That's the minimum you've got to do just to know it's marketable. And that's all that the commercial world typically does. But it also has to test the product with swings in the environment outside the specified bounds and with improper inputs that do not match the interface specification. We also test with proper inputs but in an improper, but in an improper sequence. We anticipate malicious behavior and we design to counter it and then we test the countermeasures for effectiveness. We expect the product to behave safely and securely even if not properly under any of those stresses. It may not be doing the right stuff, but it's not going to do anything that's dangerous to you. If it does not meet those conditions, it is redesigned. Now, here's a more formal, precise definition of, of uh, assurance activities, and there's five bullets to it. Assurances are confidence-building activities, demonstrating that, one, the system's security policy is internally consistent and reflects the requirements of the organization. Two, in other words, you covered your bases. You're building what you need to build. Two, there are sufficient security functions to support the security policy. If not, you've got to go create some or alter your policies and protect in some other way. Three, the system functions meet a desired set of properties and only those properties. No surprises against unexpected conditions. Four, the functions are implemented correctly. And you can do formal mathematics and processes now to assure that. And five, the assurances hold up through the manufacturing delivery, and life cycle, and retirement of the system. If you really pay good attention to all those bullets, and again, you have to expand them to see what they really mean, but that makes a little more impact on people as to how much work there is in assurance, and it's all invisible to the user using the box. It just makes the box work under all possible conditions, malicious or not, that you could expect it to work. Otherwise, it just breaks, but still breaks safely. Okay? That's the goal, not to leave them at risk. We provide assurance through structured design processes, documentation, and testing, with greater assurance provided by more, more processes, more documentation, and more testing. There is no short road to heaven on this. It's work. Okay? And that's why it's avoided. But it is necessary work if there is malice out there, especially targeted malice. If you don't have a robust assurance regime, you cannot meet targeted malice requirements. It just isn't going to happen. Okay. Is there time to go through uh, the trust stuff or not? Uh, is the uh, yeah? I you know I'll do three more minutes. How's that yeah. sound? A quick, a quick. Okay, I'll yeah. talk fast. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in 2007, we had a fiscal uh, credit bubble crash and caused terrific pain on mortgages and started a recession that we're still trying to fight our way out of. That's it was basic, basically based on credit derivatives, an instrument widely used but little understood and even less analyzed. This was and is a recipe for disaster. It eventually imploded, leading today's recession. Today, we have a trust bubble in the Internet, writing on trust in electronic certificates, digital signatures, cryptography, and protocols that constitute the foundations of modern information security. These functions are responsible for enrolling users and systems as trusted. They're also widely used, but little understood, by users. Oops, recipe problem. And they're not doing the same right correct modeling. Human trust, which we think we understand, is limited by identity, role, capabilities, and intent. I trust my surgeon to operate on me, but not to do my taxes. He trusts his mechanic to work on his car, but I do not trust that mechanic on my doctor's say-so, because I don't trust my doctor's knowledge of auto repair. Human trust is not transitive. It is given sparingly, and it's easily revoked. 
piss me off once, it's a long way back before we're going to be friends again. And heart, and it is very hard to recover. It is fragile, usually pairwise, and not transitive. I've mentioned that. <laughs> this limits scaling, which is a good thing, and usually keeps things local. Cyber trust, as implemented today, does not map to that human model that we use to naturally reason about trust. In most circumstances, cyber trust merely asserts the validity of the identity presented. It does not discuss the roles or the capabilities or especially the intent that entity may take on. It spreads easily through transitivity. If A, if a certificate A endorses certificate B, which endorses certificate C, which endorses certificate D, bang, you're going to trust D, or at least your computer is going to trust it on your B. Okay? It spreads easily and therefore widely, possibly crossing many domains and is hard to revoke. Even worse, the issuing of identity assertions is orchestrated by 650 some odd certificate authorities around the world that are trusted directly or indirectly by browsers. Mozilla. Uh, Internet Explorer, whatever. This means there are hundreds of system nodes that can make false assertions, and that has happened under certain attacks, that would be accepted as truth within the global system. Worse still, any of these 650 some odd trust authorities can sign a trust certificate for any entity on the globe, whether they know them or not. They are not restricted to signing only for those entities in their explicit domain. This is a I won't say the bad word. It is a really bad deal to have it set up this way. And we've been staggering on in the Internet because it was just barely good enough to let people buy books at Amazon. Really expensive transfers would be gone after and raped. It really would. This conceptual mismatch between what humans expect and what cyber delivers is not understood by most people, even techies. I cannot stress enough how much this is a major disaster waiting to happen. As with the credit bubble, this is a recipe for disaster. And disaster can fall in one of two ways. Either because of the mismatch between functionality we expect and they actually get, that's a conceptual flaw, something wrong at design time. Or because the implementation of what they got in cyber function, even though it's a good uh, concept, is often flawed. That's an implementation problem. So you've got two issues. You've got the concept you're trying to build and the actual implementation you're going to use. And you can get screwed on either one being done wrong. And currently, the cognitive group, the conceptual flaws are severe in our trust structure. So it almost doesn't matter how good the implementation is built. You can still have malicious attacks that I'm sure many of you guys can discuss. A separate compounding problem is that cyber trust is in, uh, functionality is implemented in software and hardware. Primarily, I'm worried about software. Hardware, you can tie down better. It's marketed on glitz and ease of use and not on the quality or accuracy, here I'd say, or the assurance of performance. They just skip assurance entirely. Even if security concepts are accurately captured in the design and actually provide what native humans expect, and that's not the case yet, it is likely that the implementation is flawed. We've seen lots of examples of that. Easy busts because of screwed up software. Ward Cunningham coined the term technical debt. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that in 1992. Yep. Mm -hmm. It describes flaws left in delivered products that can lead to genuine fiscal debt, the cost to repair later. I refine that phrase technical debt to cover both types of debt, conceptual errors in the design and implementation errors in the product. I'm not going to bother giving the example from Microsoft of their uh, attack that was found, a zero-base zero attack in February 2010, but it had been in the code base for 17 years. My God, you know, in any event. Conceptual errors are best resolved with early applied brain power during design time. Smarts, not dollars, not time, is most important. Implementation errors are typically found, and we're finding them all the time, in deployed products and can only be solved with time and money, usually lots of both. The better choice is for the vendor to pay the cost up front by using higher assurance development methods, as I discussed, to eliminate the vast majority of implementation errors before deployment. However, the usual path, even if he has a good concept, is to shift the cost and effort away from the vendor and let the customer and his clients discover the flaws and suffer the consequences. That's why we're really screwed in the external world today, and we've got to get away from that. Okay. Uh, Brian, yeah. are you appearing at any uh, conferences or speaking anywhere where uh, our listeners might be able to check you out? 
Um, I do that from time to time. I don't have a booking in hand at the moment. Mm -hmm. I typically wind up speaking somewhere in public. To I, I can provide again if you want to send me email. I can send uh, pointers. I think to I was at the New York uh, World Science Fair a year or two back, and there's still several clips of me yattering away on other topics, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I never keep track of my stuff, but I've got a list that I built somewhere when people ask questions. I can go and look at it, and I can provide it to people if they want to ping on me. Great, great. Brian, and thank you very much. Uh, for some of these assertions. Yeah, thank you very much for appearing on Paul.com. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. <laughs> very uh, well, interesting and I'm glad to be there. I'm sure I have pissed off some people in your audience, mm. and if I have, I'm glad. I hope they wake up, think a bit, put the beer down, <laughs> sober up listen again and maybe they'll finally start trying to put some assurance in their products with robust strong implementations that'll be safe against quantum computing it's I what love we it. need I love it I love it Brian thank you very thank much you so for much. being thank on Paul.com thank you so much for the invitation I appreciate it